Hi, I'm Laura Whitney and I'm coming to you from the Nelson and District Seniors Coordinating Society in Nelson. I'm here with Jane. Um, we're going to talk about hospice today. Thanks for coming, Jane. Sure. Really appreciate it. Um, got a few questions for you. Um, sure. Just talk about what is hospice. Well, hospice is basically a philosophy of care. Uh, it's really about being with people, accompanying them during the end stages of their life. Um, in Nelson, hospice looks like our organization, Nelson and District Hospice Society, uh, which is primarily a volunteer um, organization. We have volunteers who are trained to uh, companion people by the bedside wherever they are. So it could be in hospital, could be in uh, residential care, could be in home. Okay. And uh, we also provide, so we provide emotional uh, practical and spiritual support for the dying and their loved ones in all of those settings. And as well, uh, we provide grief support. So anyone who is bereaved from the death of a loved human being, we provide support for them as well through one-on-one -on -one support and through uh, group support. Okay. Yeah. And how long has it been in operation? Yeah, so uh, Nelson District Hospice Society actually formed with a bunch of people sitting around a kitchen table like this one. Um, you know, where they just thought it's really important that people not be alone when they die and that families have support. Mm -hmm. And that happened in 1987. And so informally they started then and then they incorporated fairly quickly thereafter. So by 1989 the, the organization was incorporated and had charitable status. Okay, yeah, that's been going on for quite a while. A long time, yeah. And what health care professionals do you work with? Uh, these days we work with lots of different healthcare professionals, which is a really exciting development in the world of hospice in Nelson. Um, there's a project that was rolled out through um, the Division of Family Practice, which is like the association that holds the physicians in town, um, called Shared Care. And their goal was to bring all the different professionals together for palliative rounds. So now every week we meet with a palliative physician consult a pharmacist, uh, transition liaisons from the hospital, nurses from the hospital, nurses from home and community care, um, other organizations that are involved in palliative care in Nelson. Um, so all of us come around a table and talk about uh, what, whatever cases are coming up that need specific attention. Mm -hmm. uh, so on that level, we, we work with all those different professionals. From the perspective of how we get our clients, we end up getting referrals from, it could be a nurse in home and community care, it could be a nurse at Jubilee or at Mountain Lakes, could be a physician, um, it could be just a self-referral, people mm -hmm. can refer themselves. Um, we get referrals from counselors quite often. Uh, I think that's the general lay of the land for us in terms of who we work with professionally. And uh, how is the decision made by people to enter hospice? It's not an easy one and it's one we're trying to encourage people to make further what we call upstream, so earlier in the process. Uh, we will meet with people as soon as they've had a terminal diagnosis. So as soon as they've, they've been either diagnosed with a cancer, let's say, or, or a life-limiting illness, or if they have a chronic life-limiting illness like um, chronic uh, heart disease or they have um, liver failure or kidney failure, um, they could come and begin to consult with us when their chronic disease is getting to a point where they're starting to see what the end might look like. Okay. Um, and we encourage people to come to us sooner because it makes it easy for us to easier for us to put the resources in place that they'll really need at the end if oh, okay. we've developed a relationship with them sooner. Sure. Okay. Very often the referrals don't come that way. They come in the last days, weeks, you know, hopefully months, but days and weeks is more common right. when you get them from other professionals. Okay. And then it's sort of like a rush to try to put services in and find a good match for them and right. it's, it's harder. So we really encourage people to come sooner. So it's really a, a client's decision when they want to engage with hospice. They're usually told about hospice relatively soon after they're told that their terminal illness is in fact terminal, there's nothing they can do okay. in terms of curative treatment. Mm -hmm. They're usually given that resource, but it's up to them to say, I really want to access this resource. Okay. Yeah. And what are some of the myths that people share about hospice? Yeah. Well, one of the myths is, um, you know, the, you see cartoons like this sometimes where there's like a grim reaper coming in with like oh. a scythe, you know, <laughs> black clothing. <laughs> Um, but it's all very somber and depressing in that right. when hospice is engaged, it means my life is over. Oh, yeah. And that's probably the biggest challenge that people have with accessing hospice. Um, in fact, a hospice is about living life fully. It's about enjoying every moment you have. 
Uh, people also associate hospice with a lack of hope or a loss mm. of hope. And again, it's quite the opposite. What we're doing with people in hospice is working to help them find hope for the things that are meaningful in their life, that the next thing they're going to do is what they're hoping for, that next moment that they have with their grandchild or uh, the next time they're going to have tea with their friend. Right. So it's about trying to find the meaning at the end of life and the joy at the end of life and the beauty at the end of life. Um, and humor too. That's mm-hmm. another thing. There's this this <laughs> myth that nothing is funny and nobody can laugh and <laughs> and it's not like that at all. There's yeah. lots of humor, lots of lightness actually in the work that we do with clients who are dying. So right. I think that's probably the biggest myth that we're challenged with. In Nelson, um, it's not. I wouldn't say it's a myth, but I think it's a question that people have. Um, there's often a question around what are the services in Nelson that I can access, can't I go somewhere? Isn't hospice a place? That's, that's what I that's thought a, it was. Yeah. I thought it was a building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so shouldn't hospice be a place? And of course the answer to that is uh, we would love for hospice to be a place someday. Yeah. We'd love for there to be a detached facility somewhere in Nelson where we could have beds that's separate from the residential care or hospital building. Mm. Uh, in fact, that's not existing right now in Nelson, so in that sense it's a myth. Um, we don't have a separate facility. Um, we do, though, have uh, a bed at the hospital which is designated for hospice palliative care. It's not dedicated, so there are sometimes other people okay. using that bed. Uh, there are also two beds at Mountain Lakes, uh, one of which is used for respite care for people who are palliative, mm-hmm. and one which should be used for end of life, you know, last days and weeks. Um, but isn't always available. So there are some hospice beds, but it's not a place the way most people would think of that initially okay. here in Nelson. Right, yeah. Any other myths you can think of? Uh, I can't think of any oh, right that's now. Okay. Yeah, those are the um, big ones. Do you offer services such as counseling to loved ones following a death? Yeah, we do. Um, I wouldn't call it counseling though. We're very careful about that. When clients call for our services when they're bereaved, um, they often ask for counseling, um, and we do have a list of counselors that we provide that don't work for hospice. Um, but what we provide is what we call grief support, and okay. what that is is having a volunteer who's been trained, and typically our volunteers have themselves had a somewhat profound experience with grief. Sure. Um, and they go into um, to kind of work with people either as a companion, like almost like having a dedicated friend who's only there to talk to you about your grief. Okay. So that's definitely um, the kind of support we provide, that kind of one-to-one support. And then in the group setting, we bring people together in groups um, for grief support because one of the most powerful things people can go through when they're grieving is seeing what other people have gone through and watching other people's journey and connecting with them. So getting peer support is really important. Um, so our grief group, we have a drop-in grief group that runs every Thursday evening. Okay. And anybody can call and register for that. They do have to register first, but then they can attend on whatever evening they want to. Okay. It's here in town. Uh, right now, for the next eight weeks, actually, our uh, grief group's going on hiatus. and We're running a series, and we do that periodically. We'll stop the drop-in group, and we'll have a series that's dedicated either to a certain way of processing grief or a certain kind of grief, like once a year we'll usually hold a series that's dedicated to people who are survivors of a a suicide, somebody who's died by suicide. Mm -hmm. Or we've had grief groups that were dedicated just for men in the past because they grieve in a very different way than women. So we have series that we run as well um, and those will happen periodically throughout the year for different reasons. And are the groups quite large or are they... No, they're not. They're usually very intimate. Yeah, so it's not like an overwhelming, like you show up and there's 20 people in a room grieving. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. it's it's much smaller than that. And, um, you know, the grief facilitators who we have often say when there's a really small group, and sometimes there could just be one person, okay. that um, that whoever shows up is the person who needs to be there, and that it's always perfect. Like even when you have just that one person, sometimes that one person really needed the one-on-one attention they can get then in the, in that setting. Um, and so it, it's a balance, you know. It can flow from like I said, one person all the way up to say eight people. Okay. So that's the that's the general, you know. That's great. Yeah. Speaking of the sharing experiences, um, when you're doing the uh, the grief group groups, um, I assume people are in various stages of the grief. But yeah. um, what are the stages of grief? <laughs> well, that was such a great question um, that we often hear about. Um, and the stages of grief came from a, a book by Elizabeth Kubler Ross, 
and they were uh, the classic stages of grief. Grief were uh, denial, anger, uh, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. So five stages, um, and it was this kind of it was set out as this like sort of great linear process that you would go through each step, and then you'd come out the other side with acceptance. And be done with it. Yeah, and yeah. be done with it. And that's what people want. They want point A to point B. Um, what we've learned since that wonderful framing of what grief really is, which is how this topic really started, it was she outed grief in a lot of ways, Elizabeth right. Kubler Ross, by coming up with those stages. But what we found is that in reality, people experience different emotions in different stages. And I brought this little diagram to remind me uh, because there are many different facets. And I'll just read them so that you can understand the breadth of, mm -hmm. of what they experience. Um, so there's the loss uh, that happens, there's shock numbness, denial, emotional outbursts, anger, fear, searching, disorganization, panic, loneliness, guilt and isolation, depression, troubles with re-entry, new relationships, new strengths, new patterns, hope, affirmations, helping other, and adjustment. And, and the way it's, it's just, I'll just show it, it's like this uh, valley. So people this is one concept of it anyway, you know, people are sort of descending after a loss until they get to this lower place, you know, it's almost like bottoming out, right? And then they move up and, uh, and they, they develop new patterns and hope and new connections and that's where the acceptance or adjustment to their new self with this grief incorporated happens. Um, so this is what we use now to describe what, what this looks like. And even though we do have it as a progression in a way, going from one place down and then up, mm -hmm. um, there's another schematic which I didn't print out, which has all these same stages, but the lines go kind of like all over like this. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> because in fact, that's really what happens. Everybody's process of grief is completely unique to them. Exactly. You might not experience all these things. You might just experience one or two of them. One of them might be the real highlight of your grief experience. Um, and you might go in and out. So people think that they can get from A to B and be done, but in fact, grief is something you incorporate into yourself, to who you are, it makes you a different person. Of course. And what that means is that throughout your life, you'll have moments that you can actually call grieving moments, um, where you'll go back and you'll experience one of these stages or one of these emotions or uh, one of these you know, feelings, and you'll remember you're still a grieving person. Yeah. And, so, and that's okay. What, what, what happens at the end of the process is that you realize that's okay. So that's the end point, is knowing that it's okay. okay. But in between, there's all kinds of stuff, and, and long afterwards, that wow. happens. So yeah. Well, I can imagine that being with a group who are also experiencing these things is really beneficial. It really is, and, and we try to get people to think about coming to the group even when they're not at this low point. Right. Because um, the low point is where you really need the support, and yet if some people who are, who are on the, so let's, let's call it the upswing, aren't there, right. then you don't know that that's possible. Oh well, yeah, and it says helping others too, <laughs> right. so they can exactly. see that there's hope. And exactly, yeah. and so we, we do periodically remind all the participants who've come to our group come back because you know you you may not feel like you need the group but the group might need you exactly. and um, it's it's a way that you can see yourself as having gone through a journey and gotten to a different place so um, yeah we do see that people do come back and they and they are able to provide that for others so that's, that's great really yeah. and uh, now that we're almost finished how can people find out more about it um, well, all of our services are described on our website, which is www.nelsonhospice.org. Um, they can always reach out to me. I can be reached at jane at nelsonhospice.org. Okay. And um, also we have a Facebook page, and we're fairly active on our Facebook page. We post lots of interesting articles, especially if you're interested in reading up on the dying process or hospice palliative care in general or grieving, okay. um, check out our Facebook page, which is Nelson Hospice. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and you'll see, yeah, you'll see what we're up to anyway. That's yeah. great. Well, yeah. I really appreciate you coming yeah, in, Jane. Thanks for having Thanks you, for Laura. all the information. Yeah, sure, thanks, no Billion. Problem. Affordable dental care? 
Well, yes. My name's Andrew Brown, and I'm here to introduce our next segment for Seniors Matter. It's all about the teeth clinic for people with a low income. Dr. Dobson and some of the volunteer board of the teeth clinic will talk to us about another great community resource. Hi, I'm Debbie Sieben. And I'm Barry Nelson, and we're both board members of the West Kootenai Community Teeth Clinic Society. We wanted to talk with you this afternoon about the work that teeth feels is so important to our community. Um, we know that getting a toothache or having a sore mouth is a real bear and if you aren't able to actually access those services, we want to be able to help and so uh, the society was born and we are a nonprofit organization that offers low-cost dental clinic services. We um, offer 40% off of the regular dental fees to those people that don't have any kind of benefit program. So it's open and accessible and we are working really hard to make it affordable for everyone who might have a sore tooth or a sore mouth. I had heard about teeth in the area and what they did and I just wanted to get involved and it just so happened that they contacted me at a time when they were getting this new clinic space here that we're at now and uh, everything just kind of fell into place and it's, it's just a great service for us to be able to provide care to people that are restricted through finances or social problems or, or whatever have you. Uh, the most rewarding part about working here is definitely just being able to provide basic dental care to people that uh, wouldn't otherwise be able to, to access it. And uh, that's, that's the whole reason that we're here and that's why I love working here. We primarily provide just basic dental care, um, although we do uh, provide all facets of dental care except for implants or complex cases. Aside from what everybody already knows, uh, brushing twice a day, flossing as often as you can. Um, I usually recommend once a week, although every day is ideal. Um, you know, just yearly checkups and cleaning at the dentist goes a long way, especially for seniors who the biggest, a lot of the time, the biggest thing is, is their gum health. So, you know, yearly cleanings, if you can, goes a long way. Um, if you have any dentures, you know, taking them out at night, brushing them with uh, soap and water helps, also helps a lot. I just wanted to mention that we certainly appreciate donations. We do apply for grants. And of course, if you'd like to volunteer to be part of a board um, that is working to increase access to dental care, we would greatly appreciate hearing from you. The application forms are available in every community across the region. And at the end of the, the program, we'll be able to show you a list of those locations. In the meantime, we wanted to let you know that you need to have a family annual adjusted income of $30,000 or less, uh, and that you needed to live in the region for a minimum of three months to qualify to be able to use those services. Uh, so the application process is simple. There are uh, volunteers in your community willing to help you do that. And then it's just a case of waiting for us to be able to make contact to you with you to schedule an appointment. How are the waiting times, Barry? They're really actually quite improved, particularly since we've moved in where we provide three days service every week. Uh, so somebody who is a, an emergency situation, it might be a couple of weeks to uh, get in. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who doesn't need emergency service, it could be a couple of months. Mm -hmm. But it's much, much faster than it used to be. So how many people have been able to access these services? Yeah, well, over the last uh, four and a half to five years, we've had applications from more than 1,300 people. And not all of them are still with us because they move on to other locations. But uh, we also have uh, two dentists that take some of the patients from other communities into their offices. And so those are addition to that. Our uh, seniors that we have represent approximately 35% of the applicants. Um, the uh, children are about a little over 10% and other adults are in the neighborhood of 60, 60 to 70 percent. So it's quite a cross-section of people. Mm, great. Um, how do people get in touch with the Teeth Clinic? Well, you can call us and I, that number is going to be at the end of the program. 
Uh, we're at 632 Front Street, which is a little mall, so it's free parking for people who come now. And um, How often are we able to offer clinic days here? Oh, here we offer clinics Mondays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Uh, at the, the Dr. Tanner Dobson works on Monday, every Monday and Friday, sometimes on Saturdays, but otherwise we have as many as 10 different dentists who are willing to give us their time. So if you have a toothache or a sore mouth, please know that uh, there are folks in your community that are willing to work with you to see how we can take care of that. Amen. Here's a group of active seniors showing us why it's important to keep in shape and how they like to do that. The Learning and Retirement Walking Group joins us for the next segment. I started uh, 10 years ago uh, in May and the main reason was because my husband died of lung cancer and I felt lonely. Four people they started was from swimming pool and one day we said, okay, let's go walk. And one day they said, okay, Wednesday. And since this time, every Wednesday we walk, and we developed a really fantastic group. Originally it was only four people, and now it's 35. During the winter we ski, and also some of us try snowshoeing. I saw Aliba's ad way back nine years ago when I was going to Aquafit, which um, I was doing that three times a week. So this kind of broke it up, being going on a Wednesday for the hikes, and uh, it also kept me um, agile and in shape. I love to be with these people. I love company, and it is so nice to go hiking and in company. I, I'm on my own, I live on my own, and I don't like to go hiking by myself. I definitely think it fills your loneliness of uh, companionship. I'm, I'm single, and um, I lived, moved up here and live alone out on acreage, and uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's just, I can't stay in. If I've got this to come to, I'm, I'm here in any place, any time, and it's once a week. And as you're walking along the trails, you share stories and uh, some very compassionate stories. And you're supporting one another as well. Mm -hmm. Just a pair of ears. And then we go have lunch after at, some, at somebody's house, usually every week, or in the park that we're in. And it's just great. It's mostly people who retire and they want to be active because uh, they are afraid to do themselves. And we have also fun, you know, and we really develop the friendship and I think we love each other, yeah. Today I'd like to give a few uh, fire safety tips uh, for seniors and we'll cover a couple different uh, topics and hopefully uh, your audience will find that helpful. If you have to smoke, First thing we'd like to suggest is smoke outside. You know, that way not uh, everybody in the household is being exposed to it. Plus it's just safer to have that out of the, those smoke materials out of the home. But if you do smoke outside, please, please don't ever put those cigarette butts into planters on your, on your patio or anywhere because those planters often have uh, peat moss in them and the fire could start many hours later. So the other thing we'd like to say is if you're gonna smoke in the house, make sure that it's a proper, safe, uh, fireproof ashtray that you're using, not just discarding into something that actually could ignite on fire if your cigarette butt uh, continues to heat up. Um, all, never smoke in bed. That probably goes without saying, but I'm happy to say it again. Um, as well, if you have oxygen or if any, anyone in your family has oxygen, um, you want to stay very clear of that. In fact, we recommend no smoking in the home if there's any oxygen cellars in the home. 
Uh, and with those oxygen bottles, make sure you keep them away from any heat source or any type of flame that could uh, accelerate a fire. I can't say enough about the importance about having a smoke alarm in a good location and in working condition. So with that is, we actually recommend every time you change the clocks that you actually change the batteries as well, if, they're, if it's battery operated. And even the ones who are electric operated have a battery backup built in in case there's a power outage. So change that battery. The other thing we would say, if it's more than 10 years old, replace it whether it's a, a wired in type or whether it's a, a battery operated, replace it. Now, location for them is, I always say, at, at minimum, in your home, outside the area you sleep in. And I, and actually it's code today for new buildings, is one inside your bedroom as well. So um, I would recommend, these things aren't expensive, uh, so put one in your bedroom as well. Now, if you're hard of hearing, there's kinds out there that um, will uh, have a strobe light to help uh, alert you as well as make the noise. And there are even those for the heavy sleepers who, and uh, the, the, the one, people who are actually fully deaf. Um, there are some you can get that will actually shake your bed to help you alert as well. Can't say enough about the importance of a working smoke alarm. They save lives. If you're not sure if your smoke alarm is working properly or you haven't heard it or you can't even test it properly, uh, in Nelson you can certainly call uh, the fire department and we will come to your home and we will test it for you. And if it needs a new one put in, we'll help you get that done. Um, in your regional district perhaps or other parts of uh, the area, contact your fire department. They'll probably provide you with some good information of how you can get that smoke alarm tested. We do have a City of Nelson uh, website with a uh, Nelson Fire and Rescue Services uh, portion on there, so you're welcome to go there to find more information. There's also the Fire Commissioner Office of British Columbia. You can go to that website, um, and there are a number of resources out there.